welcome to this uh, GSMS session for the Drone Interest Group Deep Dive number three. What we're going to talk about in this session is UTM and cellular, how together they are able to enable beyond visual line of sight for drones. So again, welcome all of you. I just want to give a very brief introduction before we go to our guest speaker. Uh, and we're going to talk about uh, who GSMA is and what is the, uh, the drone interest group and what we do in GSMA. So GSMA is a non-profit organization, which is an association representing the mobile industry. In here, I just want to make you aware that we have a group community group that is looking more at the aviation in general, but particularly the primary focus now is on drones and uh, low altitude drones. So how we can enable uh, the connectivity and other services uh, from the cellular ecosystem and from the learning experience that we have uh, within our association. Uh, below you see here uh, the variety of uh, our members that are part of the drone interest group. So if we go to the next slide, please, we're going to see a little bit the activity. We have two main activity within the GSMA. As I mentioned before, one is the drone interest group, which is a GSMA members um, group where we discuss a different topic about uh, the mobile networks, the services, uh, how to work together to provide the best um, in class of uh, connectivity and try to provide guidance also to our members uh, that want to uh, embark in the journey in the drone ecosystem. The other group is a cooperation between uh, GSMA, but also another organization which is called the Global UTM Association. Again, it's an association primarily coming from the aviation, and together we try to create a group uh, that focuses on the connectivity aspects cellular connectivity. It's called ACJ in short, uh, is area connectivity joint activity. In there, we, uh, we have different groups and you will learn more about this activity also during the presentation. If you go to the next slide, this is going to be my last slide. So it's just to let, to let you know that we do have a variety of resources available. We go from uh, use cases, case study that we've done before, uh, the glossary where we try to help our membership to also understand the terms in the innovation and the other way around. We have, as we mentioned, some guidelines for our members on how to utilize the best and have a profiling of the LTE, for example, to use for drones. And we have a wide variety of web paper. Some of them are pretty uh, recent, so I would really uh, urge you if you want to go and have a look at our um, website uh, so we can see all this information. And we also have online talks like this one where you can also view uh, on demand uh, if you are interested in a particular topic. So this one was my last slides. Uh, we will give you more information on the website, how you can contact us. So uh, please um, keep watching the comments so we will provide you the information throughout the session. But with no further ado, I want to introduce our next uh, speakers, our guest speakers, Chris Kusera from OneSky. Chris, over to you. Thank you, Barbara. Um, I'm Chris Kusera. I'm with OneSky. I'm head of strategy at OneSky. And uh, I've spoken with the drone interest group before, so maybe you have um, seen earlier presentations. I also serve as the ACJ technical lead. In that role, I am representing the, um, the, the aircraft community, the, the drones, the air taxis, um, and others that want to use cellular. Um, so I'm not a cellular expert, although I've picked up many of the terms over the last uh, 10 or 15 years in the industry, and I try to do my best there. But um, what I'm representing is UTM, the UAS traffic management system. Some people call it unified. Um, I think it's beyond drones. I think it applies to, um, to manned vehicles as well. And so we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, so OneSky is a, a UTM service supplier. And um, you'll learn more about what that means in this presentation. Um, I also want to say I, I appreciate the invite here and that um, GSMA has been a great partner with uh, the Global UTM Association. We were um, one of the founding members of the Global UTM Association. And 
in the very beginning, we knew that infrastructure was a big problem for drones and that the uh, LTE and cellular capabilities were ready to support to support drones. We just have some issues in terms of policy and maybe some physical uh, issues when we get up into the air for uh, interference and things like that. So we can learn over time how to adapt, um, but the infrastructure is there and it makes sense to use it. Um, and I appreciate the partnership with GSMA because the two communities uh, are very technically difficult to understand. You have aircraft on one side and all the policy and rules and how you fly and what's being developed. And then on the other side, you have cellular, um, you have the three GPP standards. And so really takes expertise on both ends and it's challenging to know both domains at the same time. So the partnership in ACJA allows us to collaborate in a, um, in a way where we're not fighting against each other, but we're learning from each other. And I, I encourage any of the MNO partners that want to be a part of that discussion to reach out and learn more about ACJA and the products that we're developing. So um, we can go to the next slide. I'll talk about the agenda or what I, what I hope to cover here. I want to go over the drone problem, maybe restate it. Um, then the UTM solution that we have envisioned to help solve that problem our specific approach to UTM, so you can see how a UTM would function, uh, how the UTM is built on standards, because I think standards are important as we move forward globally, and we'll have many different UTM companies that need to tie into many different ATM systems and MNOs, you know, interfacing as well. So we all have to know how to interface in a common way. What does it mean for an MNO to be involved? in the UTM activity, how can you get involved? Um, and then a little bit about ACJA, what we're building there and uh, what you'll see come out next from that group. Uh, and then I say coming soon, I was going to say coming out in 2023, but Barbara, I've learned that we should never put timelines to anything because uh, if we followed original timelines, we would have been flying beyond visual line of sight in 2019. Um, says Amazon and, and Wing. So um, we'll just say coming soon and hopefully within the next year, we'll see some things. Um, the other thing I wanna mention here, just before I get in, I'll, I'll pause through the different sections and see if you guys have any questions, but you know, I think feel free to, um, to type stuff in uh, you know, the chat box and I'll try to address those as we go. I don't wanna to get too far and then um, maybe the question's not relevant anymore. Uh, next slide. So just talking about the drone slide or the uh, drone problem, next slide. Um, the operating environment today within air traffic management, ATM, um, then this means pretty much crewed vehicles. So there's a person in, involved in flying the vehicle. Uh, it's a very manually intensive process and it's built around people doing things. So uh, for one, they communicate over voice. And so if you have a pilot talking over an RF channel to an air traffic controller, um, they're typically using an, an RF channel that is point to point and it, it cannot be um, layered. So you can't have multiple people communicating at the same time. That's, that's challenging if you have multiple aircraft coming into an airspace that need services and they're basically waiting for dead space in the communication channel to ask for something. You know, can you track me? Can I get a clearance? Can I come into land? Um, so people are waiting in busy areas. They're waiting to communicate and get some sort of um, response from air traffic management or vice versa, right? Air traffic um, management is trying to, to, to call them and ask them to do something. And it can be um, it can be challenging, and people can be stepping on each other. They call they cause RF interference, and there's lots of static, and um, there's misunderstandings when people communicate something over that radio link. It could be a waypoint. Waypoints sometimes are funny spellings of three or or, or five letters or or so, and you don't know how it's spelled, and so they'll try to spell it out. And it's just very clunky. And so we, we need to move away from voice. We need to move into digital. Um, and these are all things that cellular can support. So much of the 
problem grows out of communication and efficiencies and that um, causes scalability problems for drones. It's fine right now for crewed vehicles because we don't see the growth in crewed vehicles like we're going to see, like we have seen in the drone community. So that's one problem, communication. Um, the other problem is simply um, that we're operating at lower airspace. And so infrastructure that is there uh, for, for ATM, for, for crewed vehicles, was built for vehicles flying at higher altitudes. Radar can only see higher altitudes. It can't see through obstructions on the ground. Um, and the same exists for all of the communication, navigation, surveillance systems that were built for ATM. So um, if you want to navigate in an urban environment, for example, GPS is an issue. And that's why cellular, we have assisted GPS to help. Um, so the infrastructure that's built uh, for the cellular industry is tuned for those ground operations and it supports low level aerial operations better because of that, um, because of the way it was constructed. So low level is also a challenge. Um, I think those are probably the, the main issues I wanna uh, mention here, but the, the operating environment um, is also very much of an incumbent kind of space where, where a pilot is flying an aircraft and that's who owns the airspace today. Drones want to move into that airspace and we're, we're asking the manned environment, the crewed environment to do things like put on transponders. So one other issue that I might mention is the idea that there is an incumbent, there's somebody that's there and they've been doing this for years without having to change the way they do it. And now we're asking people to change so drones can fly. So it looks like drones are the enemy and that might cause policy problems. I only mention that because the, um, there is a there is technology that can be developed and transferred to the crude environment coming out of this. I mean, so we should look at the benefits to those incumbents. What can they get out of this? Why should they let us come in and innovate? Um, maybe causing some problems, but maybe solving some problems too at the same time. So we need to do that. Um, okay, next slide. So we are the new guy. On the or gal on the block, I should say. Um, we have some issues though. So um, drones aren't registered. People don't know who's flying them. So like a crewed aircraft, you have to register your aircraft. We came into this environment not being able to register aircraft. So we had to, we had to figure that out. Uh, drones aren't certified. There, isn't a, there wasn't really a certification pr process. So we had to develop that. And um, because you're not certified, uh, the ATM air traffic management system doesn't want you flying over people because there's a, a higher risk. You haven't proven your aircraft. Uh, and then, so how do you know where to fly if you don't know where people are? It becomes a problem. Um, there weren't any drone operating, pilot operating certificate um, concepts out there. Right? We certified pilots all the time flying larger aircraft. We we don't really know how to, to do this. We're doing this for visual line of sight pilots, but we're still thinking about how we want to do it for beyond visual line of sight pilots or even systems that don't have a pilot. What do you do? How do you certify the system? Um, drones can't use traditional transponders. Those transponders were built for crude aviation. They were built for lower numbers of aircraft. Um, they were built with different concepts in mind and they don't scale to the number of drones that we'll have operating unless we change the way they, they work. And so that causes us problems in terms of how to show ourselves in the airspace. How do we show where we are so the deconfliction of the airspace can work? Um, the drone can't use aviation spectrum in many cases. So first of all, we don't have uh, relays on board drones and then you'd have to have a pilot on the ground speaking through the drone to air traffic control. You don't have even the ability to communicate with air traffic control in many times, in many cases, unless you're flying instrument IFR and you have some waiver to be able to do that. So there really isn't any, any communication. Um, 
there's no pilot on board. So um, you, you don't have any eyes to see and avoid. That's the primary issue in, in flying is the detect, the detect and avoid problem. Um, and right now, the only preferred, the only method really is to use your eyeballs to see another aircraft and to avoid it until we get better policy um, around that. And then, you know, lastly, I think there's just, as we grow, going to be too many dots on the screen for air traffic control uh, to see. And so we need more automated processes to, um, we need more automated processes to basically um, authorize flights, give clearances, provide alerts and warnings, and sort of um, mitigate the burden that air traffic control has in controlling that many um, aircraft. I have a question about, I must have said crude environment. Uh, when I say crude, I mean like uh, with a person on board. Um, we used to say manned, but then um, uh, we're being more thoughtful and saying crew, an air crew instead. So it's a crude environment. Yes. Uh, next slide. So what is UTM? What, what's the solution that we have developed over the last um, seven, eight years? Longer if you were uh, with NASA, I would say. Next slide. UTM is a digital system and um, it's meant to integrate drones and I think other aircraft, crewed aircraft into the, the airspace. It does it in a collaborative way. So, um, we have many different stakeholders. Think of UTM as an ecosystem. It's not one software, it's many different partners with interface standards for how the, they would send data in and get information back out of a system. So the stakeholders could be regulators and those are ones that are setting rules and policy for how the system works. You could be an operator and you're sending in flight plans and sending in tracking data, but getting back alerts. You could be a law enforcement officer and your job is to um, put in flight restrictions when emergencies occur. You could be checking on drone activity and making sure it's legitimate. Um, so the, and then it could be a data provider. You could be a weather provider, a surveillance provider, something that enables the system to work better. So all of these different stakeholders need to be able to speak into the UTM ecosystem. So when somebody says they do UTM, they provide UTM, they're probably one of many of those stakeholders providing one concept of UTM, but nobody provides UTM holistically. Um, we all just do a, our part and enable systems to speak uh, together. So we also have to think about how we do this with tomorrow's needs in mind. Um, one of the biggest challenges is we're building a system for beyond visual line of sight and there's not that many beyond visual line of sight flights occurring. So we're thinking about the future. Um, this is one of my biggest complaints lately as I, I tell people I'm thinking five years in the future and everybody tells me to be in the present, which is frustrating. Um, so we are, we're thinking about how do we innovate the future um, now and how do we be, how can we be flexible? So when we think about um, performance for communication, we're thinking about performance for LTE and cellular, but we're also thinking about um, things like satellite communications or other systems that might come up, um, mesh networks and such. Uh, so it's a system of systems and um, it will expand to incorporate sort of all airspace users. We our name one sky is was chosen because we see it as the full domain from low level drones to air taxis to um, you know basic air traffic management and then they call high level etm uh, e airspace high level e airspace is above 60,000 feet where you'll see um, airships and so supersonic aircraft and then even into space that whole stack and you have commercial space transport going between there for, for space launches. We have to know who's operating in that airspace if we're going to be safe um, and use the airspace efficiently. So I think UTM is a step in that direction of 
bringing together the various airspace domains and getting a full air picture. Uh, next slide. So I'm crediting NASA for this one. This has been put together and changed over the years by, by NASA as the UTM architecture diagram. And maybe some things to point out here. And on the left-hand side, you have a flight information management system. Uh, in Europe, they called it the CIS, uh, C-I-S. Um, and basically it is the authoritative system that would give you data from the government, you would share information about, uh, you know, um, your intent, ability, you know, ability to get authorization to fly a clearance. But the FIMS is the authoritative source of information and, um, and authorizations to fly. On the right, you have the UAS service supplier. Uh, in Europe, it's USSP. Um, and basically, this is the the entity in the UTM that is representing the operator. So you can have a one-to-one -one relationship where one operator is the, the UAS service supplier. Those could be larger companies, Amazon, Wing. Um, you may be a smaller company and you want to just get USSP services. And so a USSP provider may be working with multiple operators to represent those flight plans and flight tracks within the system. And then you have other people tied into it, like public safety, who may want to see what's going on, but they're not flying. They're just um, they're just tracking operations, looking for security issues, uh, that sort of thing. And at the top, you have supplemental data service provider. And so that's all those different data elements that you would share with the UTM to make it more um, capable. So weather information, surveillance information, um, tracking performance of systems like GPS or, um, you know, camera systems. So a, a, uh, an SDSP is a, a third party capability that ties into the, um, the UTM. So those are the three elements that I think about with UTM is the USSP, the FIMS, and the SDSP, or you could call it the USSP, CIS, CIS. And um, I think this, the same word exists for um, other places, SDSP. Uh, next slide. This is, oh, I, I guess I left that graphic on there. Um, I apologize for that. The, the, there's a uh, architecture diagram from the Global UTM Association, and it is very similar, um, but shows you maybe more of the different stakeholders that are tied into the UTM system. So if you want to see this, you can go to the, the GUTMO website um, and uh, and there's a, uh, there's a document on the architecture. Uh, next slide. Uh, just a little bit on IASA and um, this is our course, CONOPS, how they, how they describe UTM. So there's different uh, levels, U1, U2, U3, and U4. And many are focused still on the U1 right now as we deploy UTM in Europe. Um, and the functions in U1, the core services are drone registration, uh, remote identification or e-identification, and then um, airspace awareness or geofencing. But the idea is that we need to register drones to know who the operator, uh, the, what operator is using them. We want to um, enable the drone operator to know where they can and can't fly. So that's the airspace awareness function. And then with remote identification, it is allowing us to track that drone in near real time and be able to tie that drone to the registration information so that somebody can know uh, where the drone is flying, you know, where it is, where it's flying and who it is. So if, if you have the right credentials, you could even contact the operator so those are the core services. And then beyond U1, you get into U2, U3, U4, where you're doing things like deconfliction of flights. Um, you're doing tactical deconfliction. You're integrating more with air traffic management. You're doing more flight authorization. So a lot more complex capability as you move into the, the higher um, U levels. Uh, next slide. What do we need? You know, from a UTM, I think we need a, a modular solution. It's flexible. 
there's many partners providing these different capabilities um, that provide things like situational awareness. So all the different surveillance um, capabilities out there that give us track information for manned aircraft or for drones. How do we get that information and how do we use that within our system to provide a safer environment or to allow people to, to have it uh, for security purposes? So situational awareness is key. Um, operations management, monitoring, playback. So just the basic functions of a, an operational uh, tool where you can manage a process. I want to add in a constraint, for example, because I don't want people to fly around this area for the next two hours. So that would be my process for um, an air traffic management user that wants to create restricted areas for drones. Um, but you might also be an operator user and you want to create your flight operation. So you have to create a flight plan in the system and you have to make sure that flight plan is strategically deconflicted from another flight plan. So those types of processes have to be managed. Um, I think I talked about constraint management, uh, sharing operations. So there's standards we'll talk about for how we do that in the UTM, but we need new ways to share intent because we might have multiple different UTM companies that have to speak in a common way and how do we share that information so each company is interpreting it correctly uh, and then using the information safely with rules that we've established uh, for, for how to do that. Um, strategic deconfliction function we talked about, um, providing notifications and updates. So as we move forward, if we submitted a flight plan, but then a, restricted, a restriction comes up that impacts that, how do we um, get the alerts and warnings back to the operator. They've already had a flight plan approved, but now something's causing that to be unsafe or illegal. And so we need to have methods in place to track that, um, that flight operation through its actual completion. And as data changes, make, make updates and make uh, alerts and warnings to the operator. Um, doing analytical services for navigation, for communications, for weather. How is the flight impacted by various situations? Can it um, fly through certain weather? Um, you know, we'll talk about the communications environment and what we want from MNOs to be able to make this work using cellular. And then navigation um, accuracy is another big issue, predicting that in low level environments so that we know where we can and can't fly or land safely. And that's all part of a risk assessment that you might do uh, in your uh, inter interfacing with air traffic management, right? To make sure that you can get a, a cleared flight plan. Uh, it, and we do all this in a real time 4D environment that um, you really don't see in air traffic management today. Uh, next slide. So just some notable efforts. Um, in UTM globally. This is a map uh, on the right that Global UTM Association hosts. So you can go to their website and look at this map and click on all these different uh, icons and see what those activities are. I pulled out some that I know more about. Um, Switzerland was really one of the first in Europe to deploy an ASTM standardized UTM. And it was to satisfy remote identification or EID requirements. Um, so that, that was great in terms of, uh, enhancing the standard that the community had developed and moving UTM forward, um, in other countries because they could see how the standard worked and they could adopt that as well. Uh, we were part of a Singapore effort early on. Um, it was a first urban UTM prototype looking at how, um, urban buildings obstructions would, would cause problems for communication, navigation, surveillance systems and the vehicle routing issues that would ensue from those problems. So Singapore was early on in adopting UTM and learning about that. Um, Australia is doing a, a FIMS effort right now, flight information management system to, to develop their back end for how to support, um, for how to support drones. And it's being done by the Air Services Australia, which is the ANSP. 
in Europe, there's many different countries working on UTM concepts at, at various stages, like U1, U2, U3. So it's, it's hard to go through all of those. And I, I certainly don't know all of them, um, but we are tracking a few and, um, and Europe is very, very far forward in terms of policy and moving uh, what they call use space instead of U UTM use space concepts forward. Uh, and in the U.S., where UTM was really um, dreamed up, you know, by NASA, there was initial um, TCL4 testing. We went through UPP testing by the FAA in terms of transferring the technology from NASA to the FAA for how, and they could see how they would want to use it. They did other um, projects like IPP and now the Beyond program. So there's lots of money being spent in the United States to figure out how they want to use UTM, how they want to integrate drones into the airspace. Um, the latest is the, the BB loss arc, um, which I can talk about later in the regulatory area. So, uh, next slide. I might pause there. I guess you guys are typing in questions if you have them as we go. So I don't see them popping up. So, um, if you have any type them in, we'll, um, I'll keep going. So our approach to UTM, um, one sky, and this is just a little background on us. We came out of a company called Analytical Graphics. AGI was a 30 year old company and uh, built on modeling simulation in the space, um, aerospace and defense industry. So, so the early application was knowing when a satellite was going to pass over a ground station and lots of capability was built from that concept. Um, and so the technology could do things like communication, navigation, surveillance, performance prediction, um, and was used to develop systems for managing satellites in space. So we take a lot of those analytics from AGI and um, we also bring in capability from sister companies. So Comspock was a, a company spun out by AGI uh, around the same time as these other ones, Cesium and, and us, one sky. So those are three sister companies from AGI. Comspock is a space traffic management company that's been working for over 10 years as a private company to manage um, space conflicts. So uh, satellites, you know, um, colliding into other ones. So we want to mitigate those problems. And we also look at radio frequency interference issues that are caused um, ac across the satellite uh, domain. And then cesium is a 3D geospatial tool that we use. Many of you might have, have seen that or used it as well. So we incorporate into one sky, the analytics of AGI, the traffic management concepts from Comspock, and then the geospatial environment from cesium with, you know, the, the rich flight um, plans and tracking data that we get from operators and from ANSPs to, to run our product. That's how we get to, to our capability. Uh, next slide. Now, our vision is to harmonize the sky. We want to bring together different domains um, and different concepts like air, urban air mobility and uh, small UAS vehicles, basically bring, bring that automation to, to life. Uh, next slide. We see the environment um, as sort of this stepping, uh, stair-step approach, right? So depending on what you're trying to do, you, you may be able to do things already with policy, or you may have to be to, to wait. You may have to get certified. You may have to wait for policy to fly beyond visual line of sight or to fly your air taxi. Um, but we think we can help at any point along the way with um, at the very beginning, you have ConOps development. So how do you want to fly in the airspace? Uh, what systems are out there? Can those systems support you in the areas you want to fly? So doing comms, nav, surveillance, modeling, understanding the risk, um, and even helping to get waivers and approvals using that, that an, uh, analysis. So, you know, the first step is really design and validate your, your concept. And then the next one is as you move forward, how do you test and certify those systems? Uh, so using the same analytics, but also pulling in test data, matching that test data up to what you predicted it was going to look like, and then trying to prove to the regulators that you know what you're doing. 
the last is when, once you do have waivers to, or methods policy to operate, um, we have operational tools uh, like our operations center software and UTM to take you through that process. So it's, we think it's a stair-step approach and we don't start with UTM. We start with early on ConOps development and move through that process. Uh, next slide. And the architecture for UTM uh, looks something like this. So um, we have at the very top, many different users, stakeholders of the system, and they can use different um, user interfaces. So we have UTM portal, we have operation center, you might be using a mobile app that we have. And those are all built on the same API layers, um, web services that deliver analytics. And that analytics is built on data that we integrate in from various stakeholders. So this is sort of the technology stack. You work up from the bottom, pulling in information from ATM, from um, counter US systems, from uh, local data archives. Uh, and then you, you fuse that all together. We use uh, integration framework for real-time data that we developed. We have a UAIM, we call it UAIM. AIM is a, a term in air traffic management for, for airspace information. And then we have a registry application. So data comes up from the bottom, we analyze it, we present it to the, the right user interface so that the users have the workflow they want uh, to, to operate in the ecosystem. Uh, so we have a question. What is the best approach to move from no regulatory for drone flying to something acceptable regulatory? Uh, there should be some in, interim regulatory. And in many cases, there, there is an approach. Um, it's a, you have waivers that, are, that you can get um, to fly in a small region. I think typically it's trying to do something using existing policy uh, in a smaller region to prove out your, your concept of operations. And then once people trust that you know what you're doing, you'll, you'll get the approval to fly in a larger region. And that's how we see things expanding in the US as well with, with waivers. But um, it depends on the country and it depends on the, um, the amount of risk that, company, that country likes to take. It depends on how they're set up. Some countries have ANSPs and civil aviation authorities operating separately. Some of them are combined. Some of them are more um, central in how they want to manage the airspace. Some will adopt more federated and industry-led initiatives. So it's really complex to talk about the regulatory approach for the entire world. But I think if, if, you, if you look, there is some regulatory way to start flying. Um, and then you probably are looking at waivers until you get some policy in place to, um, to fly beyond visual on a site. But in some cases, you might not even need that if you're just flying visual on a site. And certainly in terms of using cellular, we're not saying you need cellular for B BV loss or for VLOS, it's applicable to, to all drones. So, you know, you might be able to, um, you know, cellular is applicable right now in the current use case, but I think it takes drones further and it enables BV loss, which is important. The next question is uh, how will Wi Fi and cellular continue to work together in the future drone operations? Um, that's a good question. I think. I, I think Wi-Fi is an open frequency, and I've seen systems built that are um, that are larger networks that can provide aerial services. But I think cellular is a managed um, service from M and O's, and so you can get into, you can guarantee your service level agreement maybe better that way. But you could probably do that with Wi-Fi as well. Um, I don't know if I, I completely understand how you would want to use them together. So you could maybe type in a follow on to that, but um, I have seen concepts where you can uh, use cellular, maybe in flight for command and control, and then use Wi-Fi when you get to a landing pad to downlink lots of data. So you might have different approaches for how you use those systems separately. Um, next slide. So these are just different snapshots of our tool and then I'll run through a video. Um, <clears throat> geospatial and aeronautical information is really important to be able to see. This contains the restrictions for where, you're, where you can fly. 
and and some of these are time based, so the restriction pops up and then it, it goes away after a couple hours. Um, so we need to show them, and we need to make sure that operators are alerted when they pop up. Uh, if they have a flight plan that's routed through them, we have to suggest changes for their flight route uh, that they can adopt those changes and um, and be flying legally. So the types of data we pull in is restricted areas. We pull in terrain data. We pull in buildings, um, other types of obstacles, towers, things like that, um, that might be issues, and then represent that in our data model. Uh, and this is showing all that data in the, the cesium display within our, our UTM portal. Uh, next slide. Uh, weather is another type of data we're pulling in. Um, weather can come from global sources like AccuWeather or pick pick your form your your company right that's giving you data but there's also usually some national weather product that you can get to or even local weather provided by systems that um, the operator has in place so we bring in these these various data layers for weather and then we interpret that weather um, in respect to how the vehicle is going to um, to be able to handle it you know is the wind too strong for it is the rain too strong? How's the visibility? Because you can't fly in low visibility. And so we look at the, the different weather and we understand where it's safe and not safe to fly. Um, if you have a rule in place for that, you can draw a box around it. You might see that in here. You have a, a red sort of polygon that's drawn around different weather patterns. And then we can represent that, that polygon as a constraint in the UTM. And it basically says no drone can fly in that polygon right now. The weather is too severe. So how do you take data and then how do you dissolve it into something that's manageable for the flight operation? Uh, next slide. So this is, this is pretty cool. This is the coverage cell showing you hexagon cells for how we can map data. And this is proven to be an efficient way to, um, to manage coverage information. And you could map anything to a coverage cell um, this actually is probably uh, flight traffic data, not comms, nav surveillance information, um, but it would look the same. So you have the ability to generate communications coverage or navigation coverage or surveillance and weather and various constraints. And you, you think about each cell representing whether you can or can't fly in that cell based on all those different metrics um, in analytics. And at some point in time, you get green and red, and, and now you can figure out where you can fly safely and where you can't. So it's a mashup of various analytical data um, based on the vehicle type and what they're trying to do. And it allows the operator to figure out where they want to fly. In many cases, you could think this, this approach could allow you to anonymize the communications issue because it doesn't show or the coverage of communications is it shows you the combined performance. And so it's hidden in there, but it allows the operator to make decisions based on the exact data that they need to fly. Um, next slide. If you take that same information and you map it to the flight route, you can get contours along the route to show red, yellow, green. And um, you could even map it to processes, operational risk assessments, um, and uh, there's the, the JARIS SORA is an approach to manage, uh, to estimate and manage um, risk. So you can look at things like how, how much time are you flying over a highly populated area or within a, um, a densely um, controlled airspace. And, um, and then you can try to minimize that amount of time in those types of airspaces or avoid them altogether. Um, or you can mitigate with uh, having a parachute or something like that if you're ever a highly populated area. So SOAR is a, a way to quantify all these various types of risk and present that risk case to the regulator. Um, and it's a process that they have seen and, and been a part of. Um, and so the cellular information needs to plug into the SOAR at some point to say that this flight route, we analyzed it for cellular coverage and we predict you're going to have the, abil the availability, the bandwidth, you know, throughput and um, 
and performance you need along the route of flight. And that would be one metric in terms of getting your risk assessment performed and approval to fly. Um, another question was, what is a size of the cell? And that is um, up to you know the person that's defining the cell. I don't know that I, I don't have that number in, uh, in my head for what we picked. But I, I think it probably, um, you could probably pick an optimal size. I also know that you can make them scale. So as you zoom in, the, the cells can pixelate and get um, more granularity as you zoom in and zoom out. Uh, next slide. Uh, another thing that we'll do in UTM is strategic deconfliction. Strategic deconfliction um, means if we have a flight plan and we put it into the system and somebody else has a flight plan and put it into the system, the UTM system, that neither of those flight plans um, are, are planning something that will cause a conflict. So each flight plan is actually built into a bunch of different time dynamic cells. So each, each of these flight plans have volume, 40 volume, meaning they have, um, they have a volume of space that's only relevant for a certain amount of time. And so we're looking at two volumes overlapping, but do they also overlap in time? And if they do, then you have a problem and you have to mitigate. And the easiest thing would be to just start the mission, you know, two or three minutes earlier and you probably solve the problem. Um, next slide. So flight planning authorization is another one. How do you actually interact with ground control systems, bring in flight plans, bring in tracking data and represent that. Um, and this is just a, a snapshot of a simulator we've built that can, can allow us to create flight plans without being an operator. Uh, question, do you use ground to air sensors in your solution? Uh, to define safe corridors and detect rogue drones or other threats, or do you rely on other comms? So I think UTM is agnostic to how people get data. So if there is um, a ground to air sensor, we would want to have that information, but we would get that over the internet from that provider. Um, so the sensor could be, uh, it could be a camera, it could be a passive radar, it could be anything, RF sensor. Um, but whoever's defining the infrastructure for that area, that region that wants to control the airspace, they're developing that. The UTM is, is basically pulling that information in and making sense of it. So think of us as providing the situational awareness, but then beyond that, um, enabling decision support. So how do you make decisions based on the information that you can gather? Um, but we don't, um, we don't say what communication system you have to use what sensor you have to use to detect, but there are plenty of them out there. What UTM does do in the security realm is give you information on what flight plans have been created and accepted and approved. I mean, we know who the, um, who the drone operators are that intend to fly safe. And if we overlay that with all the information, then we can quickly understand who's not flying with an established flight plan. And that might be a drone that is rogue. Um, so it helps you to identify, to quickly identify who might be a threat given everybody that's out there. You know, 99% might be flying with an operation approval and then the other guy isn't. And that one might be the one you wanna look in, uh, into. Uh, next slide. Conformance monitoring, this is kind of hard to see, but um, in the middle of the graphic, there's a, an icon for the, the aircraft. And it's showing you where the aircraft has kind of gone outside of that blue 40 volume. And there's a red volume, um, this very small red outline. So what happens in our system is when that aircraft starts flying outside of the volume, we take its initial direction and we predict where it's, where it's going. We might have lost communications with it or the track. Um, and so we'll just predict where we, we know it was heading the last time we saw it and create a volume in the UTM ecosystem that says this is this is, could be a rogue drone in that area. You might want to stay away from it. So monitoring conformance is important and then being able to inform all the other operators that something isn't um, flying the way it should. And so we can, we can get that message out to all the other operators. Um, next slide. 
uh, auto routing. So another uh, capability that um, that we have that we think is important for UTM, this is showing you LIDAR wind measurements. So we can take LIDAR measurements um, with, with lasers looking at the reflection on these wind particles and it gives you very granular uh, weather detail and it's dynamic and the um, the vectors can not only be horizontal but have a vertical component so it shows you uplift or down down draft um, and that's important when you're flying an aircraft you don't want to just be thrown into the ground or be thrust up to a thousand feet you want to stay within your operating regime so we had we have to understand the weather at that granularity but then using that um, information we can provide dynamic routing and that's what's shown here um, next slide all right, let's see how much time we have. We can probably do the video, but I don't know how, if we're going to have too much time. So maybe we um, just do a little bit of the beginning, Matt, and then we'll um, then we'll just keep going through the slides. So this is the um, the simulated ground control system that we we have, and so you would create a flight plan here. Think of this as the operator is in their ground control system, creating a flight plan and sending it into the USSP. And so now this is the USSP receiving and interpreting that flight plan, building a 40 volume around it. And now you see that the aircraft is flying. So it starts sending tracking data in. We pull in all the other aircraft around the area so you can get situational awareness and understand that you're not going to run into a manned aircraft. Um, if you want to change your flight plan, then you can do that. This is showing you how we've changed it um, and it's going to go outside of the original volume. And this is, con con this is um, creating that conformance monitoring issue. So we create that red volume saying, hey, he's, he's flying rogue. He's going outside of the area he's supposed to. We're going to send alerts and warnings to everybody. And as he keeps flying, we continue to send that update on the, you know, hey, he's not within his planned flight area, but we know where he is and stay away. Um, I think we can stop it here. But if you guys want to see more videos, I can send them out. But um, just in, just wanted to show you what the UTM kind of looks like. In terms of how we get UTM out there, you know, there's the short term, medium term, longer term, future. You know, um, we it's hard to predict even a year out where we're going to be. Um, but we know that there's policy coming up for flying beyond visual line of sight. We're focused on that, and we want to have the core UTM capability to make sure that drones don't run into other drones. That's the primary issue that we're trying to solve. Um, so it, it kind of looks like, you know, an, inv an initial investment phase, trying to do some research and development maybe, um, and then moving in towards um, where you get revenue growth based on operations. So we want to move towards is, is real operations that support the business model of drones. And I think the MNOs want to see that as well. Uh, next slide. Okay, so a little talk about UTM standards. Um, we do build on standards, so there's standards on standards. Uh, um, we started out I don't know, many years ago building the ASTM standards, which have been used as a basis for other global standards in Europe, ASD STAN. Um, in Asia, they're uh, starting a similar effort uh, to, to bring ASTM there and then use that as the basis for how they want to standardize drone rules and the way we operate drones. Um, the standards for ASTM define how remote identification works and how UTM to UTM data exchange works. So how do we get um, traffic information and share that with other operators? How do we get flight plans and share that with other operators? How do we do strategic deconfliction? How do we monitor UTM and understand that it has good performance? It's alive and well. So those standards documents you can uh, get online at ASTM. And um, we use those as the basis for our UTM. Everything is sort of centered around that. There's SWIM standards. SWIM is the system-wide information management, and this is how the ATM community has defined how they want to share information, like weather information, like flight plans, tracking data, airspace information. 
and they all use OGC standards, which is how you define geospatial information as the constructs for sharing information. So o OGC is the Open Geospatial Consortium. That's how you share um, points, lines, and polygons. Like a point would represent a city or a waypoint. A line would represent a flight route or a road. And then a polygon is a, an area, a constraint, a region, a city. And that information can be defined in various standard ways using OGC. And so we base our system off of that. And then we protect it using ISO, which um, we're 27,001 um, certified. And many other companies are becoming 27,001. And this just in, ensures that you have the right process in place to protect your data. And, um, and that means internally and also how you share it with other people or how you present it in your system to other people using security practices. Um, next slide. So about the standard ASTM and how it works, um, on the left, you'll see just some, the numbered process for how this is gonna work. It doesn't line up to the right, I'm sorry. But the, the operator will send its flight plan into a USS. Here's my flight plan, USS. We would take that flight plan. We would um, look at the the um, the bounds of it, and we would look in the DSS and say, "These are the bounds of our flight plan. Is anybody else operating in that region?" The DSS would say either yes or no. So it might send back and say, "Yes, it is. There is another flight plan in this region. Here is the USS that's operating that flight, and here's how you contact them." So we get that information back and then we contact the other USSP. We say, there's, there's a flight plan you have. Can you tell us more about it? And it would send us the flight details that we can analyze with our flight plan. And then we know whether it's strategically deconflicted or not. And then if it is, we can submit it back to the DSS and say, this is what we want to fly. And it's published and other people will know from then on that, that we intend to fly as well. So, it's a process for strategically deconflicting flights, for making sure other people know about them, and for keeping them informed over time if there's any changes. That's kind of the, the process for how ASTM works to, to strategically deconflict the airspace. Uh, next slide. All right, so MNO involvement. Um, why, why would you guys want to be involved? So the problem is that infrastructure is lacking the support and the full UTM integration into the existing ATM system. I talked about issues with poor coverage for radar, for GPS. The drones can't use things like ADSB, which is an aviation standard for tracking aircraft. Uh, they can't use C2 like VHF radios because there's no pilot on board and it's clunky to use relays. We want to get more into digital communications. Um, and then the last one, unknown local environment. So understanding obstacles, terrain interference, which um, we can get into in a second, but that um, if, if you're looking around a small area, like a, a tower, you might be able to, um, to have crowdsourcing of information from drones to build a better environment. Okay, so the solution is network operators have more ubiquitous coverage where needed. So we know that there's good coverage and it's also shared based on a huge population of cell phone, you know, handset users. We would be a smaller user base that would benefit from uh, systems that have been built for them for larger communities. Um, and so UAS traffic management um, would be supported by uh, doing things like ground and air risk management, detect and avoid, and data broadcast that, that's done through cellular. Uh, and then being able to augment the data that you can provide to an operator. RTK is real-time kin kinematic. It's a GPS enhancement. So you can get centimeter level accuracy, but you have to have um, a transmitter host location, and that could be a cell tower. Um, we lack weather data. We have weather at airports, but... Um, we could have weather every cell phone tower that would give us wind, rain, um, visibility type information. Um, we could get better surveillance information for the airspace, whether that's ADSB or putting in camera systems like Iris, putting in acoustic systems, Sarah, we could put in 
um, passive radar. There's companies doing that. So lots of different surveillance that MNOs could host and then provide that as a service to the drone community. And lastly, you know, uh, cellular LTE communications is foundational for the command and control. So we could be doing um, doing a lot more with that. So I think we're just talking about that the problem is an infrastructure problem. And the solution is you, you already have quite a bit of infrastructure and it supports us at low altitude and it's shared. So it'd be much more cost effective for a drone operator to use yours versus build their own. Um, next slide. So the, the roadmap that I see for MNOs to get on board is the first step is to provide network coverage, um, also population coverage, because we know where um, users are based on their handset location, and we can share that out. Um, population is part of the risk case. We don't want to fly over heavily populated areas. So uh, you can tell us where we have good communication coverage using your cell uh, network, and you can tell us where there's heavy population that we can avoid um, for both you know, health of the network. We don't want to cause interference and also to avoid um, possible issues of falling out of the sky on lots of people. So that's the first step, just information sharing. The second one is perhaps you want to operate a USS on your own. So, you, you know, many operators, drone operators could come to you, say, I want a C2 solution. Can you just operate um, our flight plan, flight tracking capability with, within your network? And there's benefits of doing this because you, you can offer advanced flight planning services. You can say, I know how to route you more effectively or I can provide you a network service plan, like maybe a special routing table for how you maneuver through the network um, and avoid causing problems in the network. You could be a central source of um, the billing and be pulling in the money and distributing that to all the partners that help you build the infrastructure that drones need to do more. So I see number two is sort of a future integrated step where you may actually be running USS operations. And then three is the converged tower fun um, vision, which is how do we build the network into something bigger for aviation where you have other sensors, um, other, other data that you can present to the operator that allows them to do more. The picture below the coverage there is from ACGA work task two. That's um, Thomas uh, Neubauer's work task, and he's done a lot of work at Dime Tour and Tioco on how do you present coverage information as a C2 uh, communication service provider to a drone operator. So this is there's a process defined in a work task document that shows how you would do that as an MNO. And so if, if you're interested in that, then we can point you towards the work task two document, which describes that process. Um, I have a question. Are there examples of MNOs getting into being USSP themselves? And there are. Um, so the first one was um, Skyward was acquired by Verizon and going down the route of being a USSP. Um, and I think policy just didn't support that in the right time frame. And so Verizon. Um, eventually killed the Skyward effort, but many people are still working with Sky with Verizon and IoT and, and bringing this forward. Um, I don't know of other examples of, of specific ones becoming USSPs, but um, we hear a lot of interest about people wanting to do that as we talk to different MNOs. I think the reason why some might not move forward is or as quickly as we want is because of the business model. So it's a chicken egg problem of if we become a USSP and we can enable comm nav surveillance and we can build out new infrastructure, um, will we get our money back? Because we don't see any drones flying today. But um, I think over time, we'll start to see drones using more cellular services and it will naturally grow in that direction. Uh, next slide. Uh, and this is just a snapshot of Converge Tower. I, I think I briefed this before in the, the drone interest group, but the concept is host new sensors and, and um, that you could have on the tower 
and that you could support um, additional data for the drone. You can use your edge processing to do things like detect and avoid or RTK navigation um, enhancement, um, crowdsourcing of information like obstacle data. Um, so lots of different things you do for edge processing. And then the UTM is supporting everything in the background from the cloud to present flight plans, um, tracking information, um, usage tracking, registration data. So all those things that you can store in the cloud and bring forward to the edge when necessary. So that's what the, the vision is for Converged Tower. Um, next slide. And I think that's the last in the m and um, A slide on the ACJA. And I realize I'm five minutes over, so I only have a couple more here. Um, so this is how ACJA is, is sort of organized. And we have, you know, like it's representing the aviation community and the, the M&O community. Um, so we have aviation on the left and we have the, the M&O ecosystem on the right. And in the middle, we have work task areas. So work task one, two, three, and four are the ones we're actively pursuing. Um, and so on the left, we have people like manufacturers um, that are involved. There's regulators like EASA, FAA, they set policy. There's standards bodies like RTCA and Eurokai. Um, they, so they are similar to you know, your 3GPP ITU in setting standards for how um, equipment needs to be built or the performance standards of those pieces of equipment so that the regulators will trust them. So we're going through those processes with cellular right now what will it take to, to get a, um, a TSO, which is um, a technical standard order. It's sort of um, professing the, uh, the, the performance of a cellular device that is trusted in aviation. So how do you get that cleared through something like RTCA? So people like FAA and EASA will recognize it and be able to use it. Uh, and then traffic management. Um, you know, we have USS and then we have ANSP. So USS is industry provided maybe. And then ANSP is maybe government or nonprofit working with the government and UAV operator. So those are all the different people in the, the ecosystem that we support on the aviation side. And then on the, on the mobile side, um, people making modules, um, people making the, the hardware, the regulators, FCC, OFCOM, um, we talked about the standards groups and then the m &O operators. Um, so pulling those two together, you can go to the next slide. We, we get into the work task areas. Uh, work task one, and this is just off the ACGA site. Um, so cellular standard coordination left, led by uh, Stefano. And um, so the, these, this is the coordination um, with th 3GPP to ensure that we're doing things that will support the aviation community. So this is a hard task of understanding what do they need and how do we make sure that we get that through cellular and the 3GPP. Um, and so there is document, there are, are documents written already uh, by Stefano, Stefano um, that we could get to you. Work task two, um, this is where we talk about the data interface exchange between the MNO and the UTM. So how do we, how do we want to compute coverage or how do we understand population density? And then how do we present that to the UTM for planning and understanding the, the performance is going to meet the needs of the mission. And that's led by uh, Thomas Neubauer, who's with um, Dime Tour, a, a company um, established by Tioco. Uh, work task three is a standard, standard aerial service profile. Um, this was one of the first written by Jerry Le, uh, Lebon, and he's from uh, Verizon and the technical staff. Um, this is an aerial profile that shows, that, that shows a method for how you can reduce interference on the network. Um, so it requires chipset changes. So there's hardware changes that need to have happen and um, but the approach is there in the document and 
companies are working towards that. And then finally, there's Work Task 4, uh, which is led by Boris uh, Resnick. And this is helping us to get the MOPs and MASPs, basically performance um, standards through organizations like RTCA so that the regulators like the FAA and EASA will trust cellular devices in operations. So those are the four work tasks. And um, the next slide will show you just different people that are involved. Um, on the right, that's the, the different leads for the work tasks, Boris, Stefano, Thomas, and Jerry. And then on the left, those are the board members of ACJA um, from different communities, whether it's cellular or aviation. Um, next slide. Coming soon. So last area, and I think this was just some rambling thoughts of uh, where I think we're going and maybe in different regions. Um, so in the US, um, we have our first type certified drone, which is huge. It's um, Matternet and there will be more to come. But what it means is you can fly over people more easily because people trust that drone. And so you don't need to worry about seeing people. Um, you have a problem still with detect and avoid though. And that is the biggest roadblock now to BV losses. How do we do detect and avoid? Um, there's also the BV loss uh, uh, aviation rulemaking committee It's called the ARC. It's slowly moving forward. We, I was part of the ARC um, rulemaking committee and we wrote a draft and that draft was sent to the FAA. And the next step is for them to establish something called an NPRM, which is a notice of, of proposed rulemaking. And we're not there yet. Um, but once this rule comes out, it will give us a, um, a method to fly over the entire country, hopefully using ADSB and um, a right away uh, that, that says below 400 feet, manned aircraft use, need to use ADSB and show their position. If they do that, then we can see them and we can stay away from them and that will solve the DAA issue. Otherwise, we have to um, build lots of sensors around the country and be able to detect aircraft that aren't participating um, in air traffic control. Uh, the last one is something called AE, which is associated element. And when they certify aircraft, what they did was they took out things that were associated with the process of flying the aircraft. So detect and avoid communications, UTM, those are things that aren't part of the aircraft but are clearly needed to fly beyond visual line of sight. And they call that associated element. And they said that's not going to be part of the certification, but that will be part of how we clear the operation to fly. So um, we're learning more about what that means and um, how do we get command and control, you know, with cellular approved to fly. I have heard from some operators that they're using cellular that the FA is allowing them to fly using just basic ground coverage maps. So I think that might be a near term thing until we get um, better CS, um, C2, uh, C2 CSPs in place, you know, with the MNO. Uh, but for right now, it looks like they're okay with, with companies flying LTE. Um, and if you guys know otherwise, please let me know. Um, so in Europe, uh, defined policy in place for use space. And um, we have many countries doing active UTM acquisition to, to set their, uh, their SIS, their centralized you know, component for UTM um, to support drone operations, to make sure they have registration, remote ID all in place. Um, and then there's also UTM certification in progress. Now I know that EASA is at least certifying one um, USS operator. So that's good. And then uh, there's a lot of work been done on electronic conspicuity. And I think it's really leading the way for cellular, cellular use in aviation and people global, globally are looking at this policy because it is forward thinking in the way that we can use industry provided tracking over cellular um, for airspace operations. So I think that's really beneficial. Uh, in Asia, um, Australia will select a FIMS partner in the next few months, and that will be looked upon as a, a gold standard for what is FIMS. 
um, Singapore is coming out with an RFI, which is um, going to be really interesting because it'll be an urban UTM system and they are focused on lots of different um, bleeding edge technologies in this area. So next uh, slide, a couple more elsewhere. Uh, we see a lot of governments looking at tracking systems and they maybe are taking a more um, heavy look at security, not safety or drone um, operations, but looking at LT pucks to know where drones are. If you're going to fly one in their airspace, they might force you to buy an LT puck. So those are hardware devices that might be flying on your network. I mean, whether you know it or not, perhaps. Um, and then in the AAM area, advanced air mobility, uh, we're seeing vehicles flying like Joby, Volocopter. Um, I was able to sit in the WISC vehicle a couple weeks ago, which was pretty neat. I see um, these things being constructed and almost ready to fly. There's efforts underway at NASA and FAA to develop the CONOPS. And um, we have an ASTM working committee that is establishing the, the standards for how we want to fly uh, in air traffic controlled airspace um, with these air taxis. Uh, I'm not hearing from everyone that they're using cellular. I think many of them are still using standard aviation grade communications, but I think cellular will uh, make its way into those air taxis over time. Um, and then really the cities are the ones pushing forward on the policy here because I think they see the immediate benefit of providing air taxis in, those, in their location. So there's a lot of city efforts that we have to track moving forward as they come up with different um, working groups and, and maybe even projects to advance things. Uh, and then lastly, there are infrastructure concepts that are brewing. So people know that the ATM environment isn't going to support their operations. So they're starting to think about, well, how do we host sensors on towers to fill the gap? Um, so there's development of drone corridors. Um, in the U.S., there's, there's a New York drone corridor. There's the Ohio corridor. There's the Vantis effort out in North Dakota and I'm sure that there's many of these things going on globally. As we know, we're gonna need more infrastructure to support drones. And there are companies thinking of paying for the infrastructure because they know the benefit will be there over time uh, and they'll get paid back. So I think it's a different perspective that's happening here that's saying we can take this on as industry and we can provide it. We just wanna make sure that the regulator will accept it. Um, but we want to enable these things to occur. Um, and then I think the last one here, I just wanted to mention briefly, is there are other C2 systems being deployed. We see um, systems using Wi-Fi, um, systems using other spectrum, and maybe even LTE as the, the standard on those, the spectrum, but not in a, a managed spectrum. And what I wanted to, to say is that if we can't get these drones operating on cellular, you know, enable that activity. I'm worried that some of them, some of these other C2 systems might come in and take the place of what we, we can already do with cellular. So I am watching those closely, but I, I think C2 over cellular still makes the most sense. I think that's my last slide. Uh, and we have not 15 minutes, but 11 minutes for Q and A. So, so uh, no, that's okay. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, Chris. Um, what, what I want to do, even if we have a very short uh, time, I want to bring uh, online the chairs of the drone interest group. So we have Alexander Prakaski from Telus and Mr. Yusu from China Mobile. Uh, thank you both, Alexander and uh, Mr. Su. So maybe let's uh, have at least uh, one question for each of you to ask to Chris. Alexander, maybe over to you. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Barbara. Uh, thank you very much, Chris, for a great presentation. Every single time I hear from you or your uh, uh, colleagues, uh, I thought I am getting the UTM, but <laughs> there is so much more. So you double yeah. click, triple click, and all that stuff. OK, so uh, we uh, I hope to, to have uh, additional questions coming from the auditorium here. But in the meantime, uh, I will just be asking you uh, one. 
Um, how are you uh, seeing uh, the direct uh, communication between the drones uh, require uh, detect, alert, and avoid, or DAA, between the two being addressable through the, some of the stuff that we are doing uh, with the cars, for example. Uh, um, for the connected cars, we're using some aspect of the cellular network or complementary technologies to it. Are you seeing that cellular may play a role into DAA between the two drones? Yeah, I mean, it, it is a tough question. So maybe can I give you an analogy, which is the broadcast remote ID. So this is something that is in the standard. It says you can you can say where you are over broadcast remote ID and other drones can know where you are. So we have a system UTM that's doing strategic deconfliction and we can track your position over the network. But others are saying, well, we have broadcast remote ID. I already can see the other person. You know, so can't I just avoid him on my own? And I think a layered approach makes the most sense because broadcast only gives you a small region. Strategic and UTM gives you a full picture. So for example, I'll know the intent. I know where the drone is, but I also know where he's going. I know that it's going to be a future problem. So you, you get into this thing of strategic deconfliction and tactical. And for me, tactical is starting to mean that the vehicle itself is making that last course of action correction. You know, it's too late for any human to be involved. So we're just going to turn left, turn right, climb, descend. I think if we get to that point, that's the most dangerous thing that you could do. And if we can have more time to make a decision, we can be more strategic, then we can make a better decision. So I think layering broadcast strategies like, you know, broadcast remote ID or these um, V2V type systems is good, but I think let's have strategic in place too to, to make it more safe. If we can avoid tactical, that's best. In terms of cellular though, I, another point is that it may work if you have a community of drones saying, we're going to use cellular as a broadcast to make sure that we can stay away from each other. But a, the traditional aviation community won't adopt that. And it's the same issue with broadcast. If a drone is broadcasting over Wi-Fi or Bluetooth, the manned aircraft is, isn't having Wi-Fi or Bluetooth to be able to see the drone. So how do we make sure the two communities come together? And the only thing that's really accepted in the air is ADSB. So until we can transition the manned community to use cellular too, we, we can't really benefit from that. But I think it's a good approach. Thank you very much. Uh, a complex question with a lot of layers of the answers out there. I, I wanted to kind of uh, bring that one forward on behalf of the GSMB community. Thanks, Chris. Uh, over to you, Mr. Sook. Hi, thank you, Chris. In your presentation, you talk about the building standards of UTM. So my question is, what is the most important factor should be considered in building UTM standards. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think the most important is probably getting adoption, right? Um, and making sure that you can reach compliance on those standards. So if you recommend something and then nobody complies with it, you might well not do it. Um, and so that, that was something that we talked about within Remote ID is if it was going to cost too much, you know, then people won't do it. If it was too hard to register your drone, then people won't do it. We want to make sure that people adapt to what we're asking them to do, and that and that applies to standards. And if we have support of the standard from a compliance perspective, it makes sense. Then we'll have communities surrounding that standard and developing it. One of the biggest challenges, though, it seems that there are companies out there that are either in the standards community or they're doing things on their own. And I like to be on the side of the standards because I feel like I have friends. <laughs> and when I approach a problem, I know that there may be people on the other side that already are talking the language I'm talking, you know, so I can just come in and I can play and we can plug in and it works. 
it may be slower to do that though, right? To go through a standards process, we have to write a document. We have to go through a process of making sure everybody understands it and agrees with it and there's consensus. But in the end, I think we can move faster. But um, if we if others have gone down the process of not using a standard, they may reach a, a point where they hit a brick wall because they can't speak the language. They're not a part of the community. And, and this is an ecosystem, right? I talked about in the beginning, the ecosystem can only be supported if we're speaking a common language and that's standard. So I don't know if I answered the question, but that's how I feel about standards. Thank you. Uh, Barbara, I think there are some questions in uh, the chat. Uh, yes. So maybe I'll address the one. Uh, why don't we start the regulatory with the areas of the world having the most drone traffic? So it's more of a kind of common suggestion. Uh, maybe you can uh, bring your point of view on uh, uh, such a statement, Chris. Actually, I'm trying to figure out how to know where the most drone traffic is. Um, so where would you think that is, Barbara? Uh, probably I would uh, maybe ask uh, Mr. Sue. Uh, I believe probably we will, at the moment, maybe commercial is probably uh, China or China, US. yeah. So I would be a guess. Uh, maybe Mr. Sue, you can say how many drones are flying at the moment in China. Maybe you know. <laughs> uh, I think I think the regulatory approach in China would be easier because it's probably more, um, you have your ability to control it better in other areas of the world. I mean, I know in, in the US it's been very challenging because we have to reach consensus on all these things. And there's, when we go to an arc, we have 97 companies that are trying to reach consensus and each company is representing another eight that are in their association. So it's very difficult to come up with a consensus rule when we have that going on. So I, I think different areas can approach regulatory issues faster or slower. I'm not sure if it's better or worse, um, but I, don't, I think that's all I can say about that, yeah. Um, there's one uh, last question, maybe if we are able to take it. Uh, I don't know, Alexander, you wanna read it or should I? Uh, you're muted. Sorry, apologies. Uh... Sorry. <laughs> uh, the last one from auditorium uh, that we can address today is uh, if MNO drone regulations is quite difficult to be adapted, then why don't we rely on the Wi-Fi regulations? The goal is to set very adaptive regulatory, right? I would say there is no regulation for Wi-Fi. <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. In my yeah. chat, <laughs> that would be my... <laughs> Um, it, it don't, I don't want to say that there's no regulation. Yeah. So there are regulation, obviously, for any uh, unlicensed spectrum. They're all regulated or license exempt spectrum. Uh, but as we probably, Chris, as you mentioned before, uh, there are uh, operations uh, where you might not be able to use Wi-Fi because it, you don't have the guarantee. Uh, so it's up to you what the risk that you want to take, I would say. Um, yeah. It's all risk-based level. And obviously, you're not going to build a global network of Wi-Fi that you can fly everywhere. That's You can, but it's going to cost you. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, I want to maybe think... conclude with that. So there's probably yes. more coming. Um, we might be able to, so we can also respond to the comments afterwards. They're going to be visible in, uh, in a LinkedIn page. Uh, I hope it's been very helpful to all of you. It was very informative as usual, Chris. You, you have <laughs> a lot of knowledge to share with all of us. Um, so I want to thank you personally for these sessions and also thank my chairs from the GISMA Drone Interest Group for being here and present. I don't know uh, if any of you want to say thank you also to, to Chris. Please, please. I can only say we probably needed at least half an more hour and we didn't realize we we're going to run out of it. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, um, yeah I, I went too slow. I wish I could answer more questions, but I appreciate you inviting me and I'm happy to answer any questions over email or if uh, any of the MNO members want to have you know, other discussions with me, feel free. I'm here to to learn. So thank you.